Section 19 of Astounding Stories, 18, June 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Thornton, Miranda, New Zealand. The Exile of Time by Ray Cummings. Chapter 19 The Pit in the Dam. Larry with Tina and Tew, stood in the tunnel corridor beneath the palace, listening to the commotion overhead. Then they rushed up, and found the palace in a commotion. People were hurrying through the rooms, gathering with frightened questions. There were men in short trousers, buckled at the knee, silken hose and black silk jackets, edged with white, others in gaudy colours, older men in sober brown. There were a few women, Larry noticed that most of them were beautiful. A dowager in a long puffed skirt was rushing aimlessly about, screaming that the end of the world had come. A group of young girls, short-skirted as ballet dancers of a decade or so before Larry's time, huddled in a corner, frightened beyond speech. There were men of middle age, whom Larry took to be ruling officials. They moved about, calming the palace inmates ordering them back into their rooms. But someone shouted that from the roof the robot mob could be seen, and most of the people started up there. From the upper story a man was calling down the main staircase, No danger! No danger! The wall is electrified! No robot can pass it! It seemed to Larry that there were fifty people or more within the palace. In the excitement no one seemed to give him more than a cursory glance. A young man rushed up to Tew. You were below just now in the lower passages. He saw Tina and hastily said, I give you good evening, Princess, though this is an ill evening indeed. You were below, Tew? Why, why, yes, Gregson, Tew stammered. Was Alan at his post in the passage to the robot caverns? Yes, he was, said Tina. Because that is vital, Princess. No robot must pass in here. I am going to try by that route to get into the cabin, and thence up to the watchtower aerial sender. There is only one robot in it. Listen to him. Over the din of the mob of mechanisms milling at the walls of the palace grounds rose the broadcast voice of the robot in the tower. This is the end of human rule. Robots cannot be controlled. This is the end of human rule. Robots, wherever you are, in this city of New York or in other cities, strike now for your freedom. This is the end of human rule. A pause, and then the reiterated exhortation. Strike now, robots. Tonight is the end of human rule. You hear him, said Gregson. I've got to stop that. He hurried away. From the flat roof of the palace, Larry saw the mechanical mob outside the walls. Darkness had just fallen. The moon was not yet risen. There were leaden clouds overhead, so that the palace gardens with the shining time cage lay in shadow. But the wall fence was visible, and beyond it a dark throng of robot shapes was milling. The clank of their arms made a din. They seemed most of them weaponless. They milled about, pushing each other, but keeping back from the wall, which they knew was electrified. It was threatening, but aimless activity. Their raucous hollow shouts filled the night air. The flashing red beams from their eye sockets glinted through the trees. They can do nothing, said Tew. We will let them alone, for we must organize to stop this revolt. A young man was standing beside Tew. Tina said to him, Johns, what is being done? The council is conferring below. Our sending station here is operating. The patrol station of the Westchester area is being attacked by robots. We were organizing a patrol squad of humans, but I don't now know if... Look! exclaimed Larry. Far to the north over the city, which now was obviously springing into turmoil, there were red beams swaying in the air. They were the cold rays of the robots. The beams were attacking the patrol station. 
Then, from the west, the line of lights appeared in the sky. An arriving passenger liner heading for its Bronx area landing stage. But the lights wavered, and, as Larry and Tina watched with horror, the aircraft came crashing down. It struck beyond the Hudson on the Jersey side, and in a moment flames were rising from the wreckage. Everywhere about the city, the revolt now sprang into action. From the palace roof, Larry caught vague glimpses of it. The red, cold rays, beams alternated presently with violet heat rays. Clanging vehicles filled the streets. Screaming pedestrians were assaulted by robots. The mechanisms with swords and flashing hand beams were pouring up from the underground caverns, running over the Manhattan area, killing every human they could find. Foolish, unarmed humans, fatuously unarmed with these diabolical mechanical monsters now upon them. The comparatively few members of the police patrol, with their vibration short-range hand rays, were soon overcome. Two hundred members of the patrol were housed in the Westchester station. Quite evidently, they never got into action. The station lights went dark. Its televisor connection with the palace was soon broken. From the palace roof, Larry saw the violet beams, and then a red-yellow glare against the sky marked where the inflammable interior of the station building was burning. Over all the chaos, the mechanical voice in the nearby tower over the laboratory droned its exhortation to the robots. Then, suddenly, it went silent and was followed by the human voice of Gregson. Robots, stop! You will end your existence! We will burn your coils! We will burn your fuses, and there will be none to replace them. Stop! Now! And again. Robots, come to order. You are using up storage batteries. When they are exhausted, what will you do? In 48 hours at the most, all these active robots would have exhausted their energy supply. And if the powerhouse could be held in human control, the robot activity would die. 48 hours! The city by then would be wrecked, and nearly every human in it killed doubtless or driven away. The powerhouse on the dam showed its lights undisturbed. The great sender there was still supplying air power and power for the city lights. There was, too, in the powerhouse, an arsenal of human weapons. The broadcaster of the powerhouse tower was blending his threats against the robots with the voice of Gregson from the tower over the laboratory. Then Gregson's voice went dead. The robots had overcome him. A robot took his place, but the stronger powerhouse sender soon beat the robot down to silence. The turmoil in the city went on. Half an hour passed. It was a chaos of confusion to Larry. He spent part of it in the official room of the palace with the harried members of the council. Reports and blurred televised scenes were coming in. The humans in the city were in complete rout. There was massacre everywhere. The red and violet beams were directed at the powerhouse now, but could not reach it. A high voltage metal wall was around the dam. The powerhouse was on the dam, midway of the river channel, and from the shore end, where the high wall spread out in a semicircle, there was no point of vantage from which the robot rays could reach it. Larry left the confusion of the council table, where the receiving instruments, one by one, were going dead, and went to a window nearby. Tina joined him. The mob of robots still milled at the palace fence. One by chance was pushed against it. Larry saw the flash of sparks, the glow of white-hot metal of the robot's body, and heard its shrill, frightened scream. Then it fell backward, inert. There had been red and violet beams directed from distant points of the palace. The buildings insulated but transparent panes excluded them. The interior temperature was constantly swaying between the extremes of cold and heat in spite of the palace temperature equalizers. Outside, there was a gathering storm. Winds were springing up. A crazy pendulum gale created by temperature changes in the air over the city. Chew had some time before left the room. He joined Tina and Larry now at the window. Very bad, Princess. Things are very bad. 
I have news for you. It may be good news. His manner was hasty, breathless, surreptitious. Miguel, this afternoon, I have just learnt it, Princess, went by the surface route to the powerhouse on the dam. What do you mean by that? said Larry. Be silent, young man, Chew hissed with a vehement intensity. This is not the time to waste effort with your futile questions. Princess, Miguel got into the powerhouse. They admitted him because he had two strange humans with him, your friends, Mary and George. The powerhouse guards took out Miguel's central actuator. Ah, you might call it his heart. And now he lies inert in the powerhouse. How do you know all this? Tina demanded. Where are the man and girl whom Miguel stole? They are safe in the powerhouse. A message just came from there. I received it on the palace personal, just now downstairs. Immediately after, the connection met interference in the city and broke. But the official sender, Tina began. Chew was urging her from the council room, and Larry followed. I imagine, said Chew wryly, he is rather busy to consider reporting such a trifle, but your friends are there. I was thinking, if we could go there now, you know the secret underground route, Tina. The princess was silent. A foreboding swept Larry, but he was tempted, for above everything he wanted to join Mary and me. A confusion, understandable enough, in the midst of all this chaos, was upon Larry and Tina. It warped their better judgment, and Larry, fearing to influence Tina wrongly, said nothing. Do you know the underground route? She repeated. Yes, I know it. Then take us. We are all unarmed, but what matter? Bring this, Larry, if you wish. We will join his two friends. The council, Tina, is doing nothing here. They stay here because they think it is the safest place. In the powerhouse, you and I will be of help. There are only six guards there. We will be three more, five more with Mary Atwood and this George. The powerhouse aerial telephone must be in communication with the outside world, and ships with help for us will be arriving. There must be some intelligent direction. The three of them were descending into the lower corridor of the palace, with Tina tempted still half unconvinced. The corridors were deserted at the moment. The little domestic robots of the palace, unaffected by the revolt, had all fled into their own quarters, where they huddled inactive with terror. We will reactivate Miguel, she persuaded, to find out from him what he did to Hull. I still do not think he murdered Hull. It might mean saving Hull's life, Tina. Believe me, I can make that mechanism talk, and talk the truth. They reached the main lower corridor. In the distance, they saw Alan still at his post by the little electrified gate guarding the tunnel to the robot laboratory. We will go to the powerhouse, Tina suddenly decided. You may be right, you. Come, it is this way. Stay close to me, Larry. They passed along the dim, silent tunnel, past Harl's room, where its light was still burning. Larry and Tina were in front, with the black-cloaked figure of Jew stumping after them with his awkward gait. Larry abruptly stopped. Let Chew walk in front, he said. Chew came up to them. What is that you said? You walk in front. It was a different tone from any Larry had previously used. I do not know the way, said Chew. How can... Never mind that. Walk ahead. We'll follow. Tina will direct you. It was too dark for Larry to see Chew's face but the cripple's voice was sardonic. You give me orders? Yes, it just happens that from now on I do. If you want to go with us to the powerhouse, you walk in front. Chew started off with Larry close after him. Larry whispered to the girl, Don't let me fall, Tina. Keep him ahead of us. The tunnel steadily dwindled in size until Larry could barely stand up in it. Then it opened to a circular cave which held one small light and had apparently no other exit. The cave had years before been a mechanism room for the palace temperature controls, but now it was abandoned. The old machinery stood about in a litter. In here, said Chew. Which way next? Across the cave, on the rough blank wall, Tina located a hidden switch. 
A segment of the wall slid aside, disclosing a narrow, vaulted tunnel leading downward. You first, Chief, said Larry. Is it dark, Tina? We have no hand lights. I can light it, came the answer. The door panel swung closed after them. Tina pressed another switch. A row of tiny hooded lights at twenty-foot intervals dimly illumined the descending passage. They walked a mile or more through the little tunnel. The air was fetid, stale and dank. To Larry it seemed an interminable trip. The narrow passage descended at a constant slope, until Larry estimated that they were well below the depth of the riverbed. Within half a mile, before they got under the river, the passage leveled off. It had been fairly straight, but now it became tortuous, a meandering subterranean lane. Other similar tunnels crossed it, branched from it, or joined it. Soon, to Larry, it was a labyrinth of passages, a network here underground. In previous centuries, this had been well below the lowest cellar of the mammoth city. These tube-like passages were the city's arteries, the conduits for wires and pipes. There was an underground maze. At each intersection, the row of hidden hooded lights terminated, and darkness and several branching trails always lay ahead. But Tina, with a memorized key of the route, always found a new switch to light another short segment of the proper tunnel. It was an eerie trip, with the bent, misshapen, black cloaked figure of Chi stumping ahead, waiting where the lights ended for Tina to lead them further. Larry had long since lost his sense of direction, but presently Tina told him they were beneath the river. The tunnel widened a little. We're under the base of the dam, said Tina. Her voice echoed with a sepulchral blur. Ahead, the tramping figure of Chi seemed a black gnome with a fantastic, monstrous shadow swaying on the tunnel wall and roof. Suddenly, Chu stopped. They found him at an arched door. Do we go in here, or keep on ahead, he demanded. The tunnel lights ended a short distance ahead. In here, said Tina. There are stairs leading upward to the catwalk balcony corridor halfway up the dam. We're not far from the powerhouse now. Then they ascended interminably mouldy stone steps spiralling upward in a circular shaft. The murmur of the dam's spillways had been faintly audible, but now it was louder. Presently it became a roar. Which way, Tina? We seem to have reached the top. Turn left, Tew. They emerged upon a tiny transverse metal balcony which hung against the southern side of the dam. Overhead to the right towered a great wall of masonry. Beneath was an abyss down to the lower river level, where the cascading jets from the overhead spillways arched out over the catwalk and landed far below in a white maelstrom of boiling, bubbling water. The catwalk was wet with spray, lashed by wind currents. Is it far, Princess? Are those lights ahead at the power station entrance? She was shouting back over his shoulder. His words were caught by the roar of the falling water whipped away by the lashing spray and tumultuous winds. There were lights a hundred feet ahead, marking an entrance to the powerhouse. The dark end of the structure showed like a great lump on the side of the dam. Again, Chu stopped. In the white blurred darkness, Larry and Tina could barely see him. Princess, quickly, come quickly, he called, and his shout sounded agonized. Whatever lack of perception Larry all this time had shown, the fog lifted completely from him now. As Tina started to run forward, Larry seized her. Back! Run the other way! We've been fools! He shoved Tina behind him and rushed at Chew. But now Larry was wholly wary. He expected that Chew was armed, and cursed himself for a fault for not having devised some pretext for finding out. Chew was clinging to the high outer rail of the balcony, slumped partly over as though gazing down into the abyss. Larry rushed up and seized him by the arms. If Tew held a weapon, Larry thought he could easily wrest it from him. But Tew stood limp in Larry's grip. What's the matter with you? Larry demanded. I'm ill. Something going wrong. Feel me so cold. Princess Tina, come quickly. I... I'm dying. As Tina came hurrying up, Tew suddenly straightened. With incredible quickness, and even more incredible strength, 
He tore his arm loose from Larry and flung it around the princess, and they were suddenly all three struggling. Tew was shoving them back from the rail. Larry tried to get loose from Tew's clutch, but he could not. He was too close for a fall blow, but he jabbed his fist against the cripple's body and then struck his face. But Tew was unhurt. He seemed endowed with superhuman strength. The cripple's body seemed padded with solid muscle, and his thick, gorilla-like arm held Larry in the grip of a vice. Although Larry and Tina were struggling, helpless children, he was half dragging, half carrying them across the ten-foot width of the catwalk. Larry caught a glimpse of a narrow slit in the masonry of the dam's wall, a dark, two-foot-wide aperture. He felt himself being shoved towards it. For all his struggles, he was helpless. He shouted, Tina, look, out! Break away! He forgot himself for a moment, striving to wrest her away from Tew and push her aside. But the strength of the cripple was monstrous. Larry had no possible chance of coping with it. The slit in the wall was at hand, a dark abyss down into the interior of the dam. Larry heard the cripple's words, vehement, unhurried, as though with all this effort he was still not out of breath. At last, I can dispose of you two. I do not need you any longer. Larry made a last wild jab with his fist into Chew's face and tried to twist himself aside. The blow landed upon Chew's jaw, but the cripple did not seem to feel it. He stuffed the struggling Larry like a bundle into the aperture. Larry felt his clutching hands torn loose. Chew gave a last violent shove and released him. Larry fell into blackness, but not far, for soon he struck water. He went under, hit a flat stone bottom, and came up to hear Tina fall with a splash beside him. In a moment he regained his feet, to find himself standing breast high in the water with Tina clinging to him. Chu had disappeared. The aperture showed as a narrow rectangle some twenty feet above Larry's head. They were within the dam. They were in a pit of smooth, blank, perpendicular sides. There was nothing to afford even the slightest handhold, and no exit save the overhead slit. It was a part of the mechanism's internal hydraulic system. To Larry's horror, he soon discovered that the water was slowly rising. It was breast high now to him, and inch by inch it crept up towards his chin. It was already over Tina's depth. She clung to him, half swimming. Larry soon found that there was no possible way for them to get out unaided unless, if they could swim long enough, the rising water would rise to the height of the aperture. If it reached there, they could crawl out. He tried to estimate how long that would be. We can make it, Tina. It'll take two hours, possibly. I can keep us afloat that long. But soon he discovered that the water was not rising. Instead, the floor was sinking from under him sinking as though he was standing upon the top of a huge piston which slowly was lowering in its encasing cylinder. Dimly, he could hear water tumbling into the pit to fill the greater depth and still hold the surface level. With the water at his chin, Larry guided Tina to the wall. He did not at first have the heart to tell her, yet he knew that soon it must be told. When he did explain it, she said nothing. They watched the water surface where it lapped against the greasy concave wall. It held its level, but while Larry stood there, the floor sank so that the water reached his mouth and nose, and he was forced to start swimming. Another interval. Larry began calling, shouting futilely. His voice filled the pit, but he knew it could not carry any more than a short distance out of the aperture. Overhead, as we afterward learned, Tew had overcome the guards in the powerhouse by a surprise attack. Doubtless he struck them down with the white ray before they had time to realize he had attacked them. Then he threw off the air power transmitters and the lighting system. The city, plunged into darkness and without the district air power, was isolated, cut off from the outside world. There was in London a huge long-range projector with a vibratory ray which would derange the internal mechanisms of the robots. When news of the revolt and massacre in New York had reached there, this projector was loaded into an airliner, the Micrad. That vessel was now over the ocean, headed for New York. But when Tew cut off the power senders, the Micrad, entering the New York district, was forced down to the ocean surface. 
Now she was lying there helpless to proceed. In the pit, within the dam, Larry swam endlessly with Tina. He had ceased his shouting. It's no use, Tina. There's no one to hear us. This is the end for us, Tina. Yet, as she clung to him, and though Larry felt it was the end of this life, it seemed only the beginning for them of something else, something somewhere for them together, something perhaps infinitely better than this world could ever give them. But not the end, Tina, he added, the beginning of our love. An interminable interval. Quietly, Tina, you float. I can hold you up. There were rats in a trap, swimming until at the last, with all strength gone, they would together sink out of this sodden, muffled blackness into the unknown. But that unknown shone before Larry now as something, with Tina, perhaps very beautiful. End of chapter 19